Long have the Vikings raided our lands, but nothing prepared us for their great army. For a decade we fought them, the tide of battle ebbing back and forth, until finally they were defeated and their great army fled our lands. Now, England lies divided, its old political order washed away. Too long have we fought amongst ourselves. Now is the time to unite as England. Total War Thrones of Britannia is one of Creative Assembly's new additions to their large collection of strategy games. It's also the introductory installment of the Saga series, which focuses on shorter his historical periods concentrated in one region. In this case, we're talking about the 100 to 150 years before 1066, the year of Battle of Hastings, where William the Conqueror defeated and killed Harald Hadrada and thus subjugated much of England under his crown. Thrones of Britannia came out this year's May, and Creative Assembly announced it a good half a year before its release. I was quite excited about this project. The developers promised a smaller but much more detailed and denser experience than their previous giants, Total War Warhammer 2 and Total War Rome 2 respectively. A range of experiments, recruitment, food supply and public order systems, infantry concentrated warfare, cultural distinctions between factions, presented themselves as new or refined mechanics which would expand the franchise's potential. The game's creative director, in fact, modded Total War Medieval 2 before Creative Assembly hired him. Now, it's been three months since the game's release. A lot has happened. Updates, tweaks, blog posts about development process, and also a lot of criticism. Bitter, enraged criticism, either from the Steam discussions, forums, or Total War's Reddit itself. Severe skepticism plagued the game's development since its announcement, and it didn't abate before and after release. To be frank, the negativity heightened to a new degree. The sharpest distinction between Thrones of Britannia and its much larger cousins is the level of concentration. Due to their budget, scope and workload, it is often difficult for Grand Total Wars to have in-depth, well-detailed concepts realised. Often this results in simplification, streamlining or outright elimination if it doesn't work at all. As such, historical Total Wars, for example, can feel limited, inaccurate, or, well, thin in content. And only future expansion packs, DLCs, or FLCs may change that. Thrones of Britannia, though, is the very first Total War game where this problem isn't present. The two centuries depicted here and all its research details are enough, so to speak, to not impede the fiscal realities for Creative Assembly's smaller teams. As such, the game's geoscape is complex in every aspect imaginable. Your provincial and regional economies are more varied, with each housing its own distinguished resource, agricultural yield or socio-cultural landmark. All of them are buttressed by exhaustive yet informative description. How did the local peasantry process the resource, in what facilities, and how much wealth could be acquired from it. This gives you both an educated perspective on early medieval societies in the British Isles, and how much the, de the developers cared about the details. Everything has been considered, implemented, and refined later down the line. The economy's diversification goes even further. There are several categories that generate seasonal income, and those categories are further branched out, particularly in the latest Allegiance update. Fishing, cattle and hunting all reside under agriculture, but also orchards, warehouses and foodstuff stockpiles. Industry has a similar structure. Silver, tin and copper are your basic mining facilities, though sawmills, workshops and smithies also belong here. Gold mines, unlike in other Total War games, are very rare in this game, but when you control them, you get a substantial treasure trove each season. 
The major factions you play also get cultural bonuses that are often tied to these details. The Irish, for example, led by High King Flanshina, have an increased income percentage for churches. Sea Vikings have that advantage sequestered for their slave ports and long forts. The minutia is crucial here, more than in any other Total War game. Together, they intertwine and form the game's core. This careful but still impressive level of design is extended further, and I'll show you how a bit later. In their critiques, games journalists and reviewers depicted Thrones of Britannia's construction phases like a card mechanic. Green belongs to green, red belongs to red, yellow belongs to yellow. Red doesn't mix with yellow, and so on and so forth. This has often been highlighted as an example of the game's largest problem. The supposed quote-unquote bare-bones content. On deeper analysis, I can't agree with that. As I've mentioned before, previous Total Wars had to simplify and streamline construction and resource acquisition. Total War Warhammer 2 has resources tied to one three-level building chain, with each level providing a minor bonus to the province and, sometimes, the entire faction. Total War Medieval 2 had resources strewn across the map and not tied to a faction or region, but you had to use either a merchant to control it, or in the case of metals, build a mine. And that's it. There you have it. In Thrones of Britannia pre-update, it already offered you much more. As your kingdom grows and you conquer more regions from cultural rivals or outright political enemies, you're forced to think more about your future. Do you invest in food supply first, or get that mining going to purchase more troops? Will churches grant you more coin, or will you settle yourself with industry? I mean, who wouldn't in this fucking economy? <clears throat> Will a provincial capital have a strong garrison to demoralize a potential invader through patrols and excellent equipment? Or will it be your religious center for intrigue and diplomatic maneuvers? The Allegiance update thrust the complexity ever deeper into this game. Now, at level 4, each building slot is split into two distinct modes. Will you hire a fishmonger for your fishes and sell the meat? Or will you transform it into a fish wharf so that they catch more yield and store more food for your subjects and armies. As a statesperson, you must consider a bevy of variables that can enhance your kingdom's prosperity or burn it down for your excessive expansions into industry or commerce. Too much food consumption or a too heavy workload can render the populace rebellious, and let me tell you, rebellions in this game aren't an easy challenge to beat. Let's move on to food. It now has a macro and a micro level. The former has a factional status. On the top of your screen, you can observe how much food is consumed, by who, and how much food is generated. Pre-Allegiance update had only the number and statistics below, but the post-update version now has a useful colored slider that presents much more information just from a glance. Food management has also been made much more difficult since release date. One of the game's weaknesses Late in the effortless preservation of your surplus, no matter what campaign stage you've reached, Gwynedd, for example, pre-update, the Welsh needed one, two, maybe three low-level farms at most to avoid a famine. Now, every farm matters, every upgrade matters, and one 20-stack army can burn a good third or half of your food. As you can see from some of the footage of my media campaign, I've accumulated quite a few agricultural resources, and yet, my two 20 stacks pinned me to a near-starved situation. Army supplies are the food subsection. Every force you field has a meter, right here, that shows how long it can wage battle before it has to return home and replenish. On high seas, far away from your kingdom, or surviving several skirmishes at once can turn your remainder hungry. Supplies are provided by high-level agricultural estates and stockpiles constructed in provincial capitals. The post-update difficulty raised their importance quite a bit, so now you can't consider them as another bonus, but a serious investment for the future. Previous Total Wars struggled with food management implementation. I mean, as much as I adore it, Total War Warhammer 2 doesn't even have a food mechanic if you exclude the Skaven. Total War Shogun 2 and Rome 2 only have the Macrosphere, but they're still more simplified than in this game. Thrones of Britannia is also the first installment 
where I genuinely feel food production is essential for my campaigns. So to me, the bare bones, gutted and simplistic arguments are either exaggerated or ignorant. Total War never had such an in-depth contemplative economy before. It never gave you so many variables, all equally beneficial. I consider this infrastructural experimentation as a success based on the examples I've already examined. Let's stay in the Geoscape a bit more to explore faction differences and their characters. Before its release, there was one large question that loomed over the game's future. With the release of Total War Warhammer 2 and its unique races, and the gigantic size of Total War Rome 2, how is Thrones of Britannia going to compete with that? How can a short, concentrated period beat the admittedly more attractive size of its cousins? No pun intended. Well, kind of intended. To me, that's a legitimate concern, which, however, required a different approach this time. To be blunt, you can't make Thrones of Britannia as diverse and unique as the previous titles. For the sake of historical accuracy, cohesion and consistency, you can't go too wild with the title or experiment too much. What the official peer-reviewed sources provide, that is going to be your guide for development. If early medieval British Isles relied on strong infantry, and didn't have stirrups or mounted knights yet, you can't do much about it. History is just as much of a telescope as it is a birdcage. The answer then? Tighten the historical accuracy and game design. Diversify factions through culture, which shall be represented by several key mechanics. Thrones of Britannia has exactly what I've described. Your 10 choices, nine of them major factions of the era, one being an alternative history take by Creative Assembly, are placed into five cultural slots, and the two in each slot have slight differences as well. Mida and Kirken might belong into one group, the Gales, but their strengths distinguish them from each other. These mechanics are implemented in faction bonuses, the characters revealed on the battlefield, and your kingdom's real politic. The former of the three is a classic seen since the days of Total War Shogun 2, but the other two have had a very interesting spin on things. Characters, generals that is, since Thrones of Britannia doesn't have agents, were to me the most curious. To simplify, they're a mix of previous historical total wars, Shogun 2, Rome 2 to name some, and the Total War Warhammer series. They're not immortal or singularly destructive on the battlefield. A well-aimed volley of javelins can take down any of them with ease. However, their gained retinue and traits can give you a significant advantage over any enemy you face. Retinue is more rigid and fixed in this game. You have a list of selected subjects that can help your general. In previous installments, these were given to you on a random roll. In the case of Total War Warhammer 2, very random. But here, you can choose from the start whichever you want. A bard could increase your general's zeal which helps with public order and battlefield morale. A quartermaster can make your force march much farther than anyone else, while a champion can turn your leader's bodyguards into a fearsome threat. As their levels go up, if a total of five, their boosts are incredible, in a balanced, smart way. Generals have a maximum level cap of 10, so you can spend all your points in either two of your subjects or invest each point in everyone. This reflects Thrones of Britannia's complex geoscape, based on what faction you play, what is their military, and your future conquests, you must plan out your king beforehand. What's better, no subject is useless, even the priest can be handy, whose massive public disorder in an enemy province can sprout rebellions in ludicrous speed. Traits underwent a significant change between pre and post update. They're dependent on an RNG model mentioned earlier, which can conjure up both positive and negative stats for your character. Another flaw one could point out in the Rose of Britannia is the lack of traits. They didn't appear often, but when they did, their advantages or disadvantages were ineffective, uninteresting, forgettable. The Allegiance update, however, resolved that issue through more traits that appear at a faster rate and rely on two determinants now, RNG and action. For example, if your king stays around agricultural estates a lot, he can gain a farmer trait, which improves that region's yield every season. 
Or, if a character has been a usurper for a long while, they can get mad, vengeful, or conspiratorial. Painful traits because they cause public disorder, corruption, and usurper allegiance. Old veteran characters can become so powerful, their mere presence on the battlefield swings the entire war to your side. On the other hand though, if they die, the effect of that loss is felt for several turns even. Cultural differences are the focal point of your real politic. While every major faction has a long victory conditions list, present since the days of Total War Empire, each faction, at the same time, faces different challenges in the details, bonuses, events, or diplomacy. These shape the way you'll develop your economy and military engagements. Gaelic tribes will stick closer together, while the Anglo-Saxons will gladly bury their axes in settled Viking skulls. Mierce, an Anglo-Saxon major faction in a sharp decline due to the Norse raiders, has a horde system, a redistribution of wealth to suppress dissidents and gain loyalty from characters. Ethelred's kingdom has a white hand counterpart. Decrees conducted by nobility summits which determine Wessiax's future for the next years. The Allegiance update brought another inclusion into this, inspired by Total War Warhammer 2's rights. Whatever faction you'll play, it'll get a sheet of four triggerable events with a wide range of benefits. Public order, better harvests, morale or diplomatic treaties. They cost a lot, but last for several turns, and can avert a catastrophe on higher difficulties. To me, this is the answer to a game of a much smaller diversity. Concentration on the content's density, not on its scale, can provide as much enjoyment and play variation. In fact, to produce a good game in Thrones of Britannia, Creative Assembly didn't have any other choice. Some critics believed that a greater, more fun diversity could have helped it during release, but that would diminish the historical accuracy and cohesion, a crucial goal for the developers. And true, they should have gone a bit deeper before the Allegiance update, but its existence, and the team's dedication, tells me they understood their mistakes well and opted for improvements. There are several other examples I could analyze in this Geoscape. The updated, more significant family tree of the crown, how allegiance works, and the full warfare's introduction, followed by its elimination, a mechanic that meant to portray your people's eagerness to wage a campaign. However, these corroborate my analysis, whether it is the curious implementation or the availability of several options that provide you numerous means towards a successful playthrough. Thus, I think I'd repeat myself here while presenting the same position over and over again. The Geoscape's technical aspects are its last subsection I want to discuss. From its announcement, the Attila clone meme began to spread on Reddit and Total War's Facebook like the fucking plague it is. Yes, it's undeniable that the Attila engine has been used in Thrones of Britannia, but then again, it takes years for a new engine to appear in a series, and if that old engine still serves well and doesn't need a massive overhaul, why is change required? This is the weakest argument from Total War purists, because it shows how little they understand what an engine is and the uselessness of this point. Yes, an Attila engine powers Thrones of Britannia. And? Here, we have a game whose scope and budget are smaller, but a denser concentration in details. Of course, a supposedly weaker engine will be used. And it is the Geoscape's color, level of depth and overall beauty that shatters this criticism the most. Creative Assembly has created the most intricate British Isles to date. Not even the Kingdom's expansion pack for Medieval 2 had this amount of dedication in it. Geography is distinct in each major region, from Ireland to Wales, and its palette represents the emerald green and steel grey so ubiquitous yet typical of this ocean-locked location. The soundtrack complements this beautifully. It's as subdued, quiet, and ponderous as the mountain ranges that guard your Gwynedd or the harsh wind of Kirken Highlands. The UI has been stylized the way artistic works were created back in the day. Character portraits are made from stained glass, and icons have this simple, etched aesthetic to it. Factional AI has gone through a significant change between pre-allegiance and post-allegiance versions. It must be admitted that, in its release form, your opponents behaved in the Geoscape similarly to other unpatched Total Wars, 
They didn't protect their heartlands from your relentless assaults, provided ludicrous diplomatic offers, and built structures which had next to no benefit for that entire province. I remember this from my Kirken and Gwynedd campaigns, where the weaker, secondary factions had no difficulty in them. And sure, I had to take my time with Miercha and with Siaxa, but they too suffered weaknesses that simplify the challenge a lot. Now, that's not quite so these days. Factions are more defensive, prone to upgrade their garrisons, construct public order landmarks, and heavily focus on agriculture. They'll declare war on you if you're their political enemy, and they're more sensitive to hostile deeds towards factions they're friends with. When they're so close to total subjugation from you, they'll plead for a ceasefire and offer exuberant rewards for your kindness the closer you'll get to their extinction. On the other hand, if you attack their ally, vassal, or intervene in their pact, they will strike back. It's very rare to see a faction break their word. Another beneficial improvement is their expansionism. In previous games, Total War Warhammer 2 being the circus example, factions can expand in the most bizarre ways imaginable. In Thrones of Britannia, though, it is far more controlled and reasonable. A Gaelic tribe will never conquer an Anglo-Saxon territory, and the Irish will raid the Welsh lands but not occupy them. Vikings will be all over the place, which mimics the historical accounts that portray them as a threat to all which can appear from any direction. I haven't encountered almost no glitches or bugs, but my personal experience, of course, doesn't invalidate problems of other players. Although, when I recall its release version, it has had a smooth, stable condition similar to that of Total War Warhammer 2, and that's a genuine improvement since the infamous Total War Rome 2 launch. Honestly, Thrones of Britannia's Geoscape is spectacular. It doesn't have the grandiosity and imperial feel of previous Total Wars, but you do far less politics and intrigue there than in here. This is a Total War with one of the most active and substantive Geoscapes. When I play these games, usually, I pay a lot of attention to my empire's infrastructure and diplomacy, but in Thrones of Britannia I was more cautious, contemplative, mindful of my decisions. I checked every region and didn't just almost automatically click on what I've desired the most. I reviewed each option, pondered the long-term benefits, and chose what was the best for my situation. I felt excitement for each upgrade completion, read its history, and gained knowledge about early medieval British Isles more than I thought I would. I looked at my age, wrinkled Flanchina, and often reminisced about his stature as High King, what battles he fought, what he conquered under my guidance. He feels powerful in battle, after all the points I spent to his champion. His noble subjects can be loyal, but also treacherous, and the dilemmas of potential assassination and bribery had greater significance due to his bard, who could sway the peasantry to the High King's side and thus shrink his usurper's power. And then his right hand, Ailil, who fended off four fucking Lachlan forces and killed their king, Eirik, which allowed me to unify Ireland under Gaelic authority. His quartermaster can carry the army thrice across the distances Flanchina travels, and his forager can replenish his forces in two, three turns. These characters grow on you, you know their beginnings and their ends, and then you look upon how their country evolves and feel connected to that too. And not just Mida, I remember my very first campaign as Gwynedd under Rodri's sovereignty. This was in the pre-update version, and while flawed without any of the allegiance tweaks, his war against West Siaxa had me do some of the most intense, brutal battles in Southwest England. Because of this engagement, and the Geoscape's density, Thrones of Britannia gains a much more personal and rewarding effect as a small-scale strategy game. Thrones of Britannia also scored several firsts in the Warscape. Previous historical titles always had a mix in every military. A bit of cavalry here, artillery there, infantry over there. Then, they spiced up these factions by one small to medium-sized focus. Bonus to archery, heavy cavalry, or strong infantry. This total war covers a period where wide, vast infantry lines were the lock and key to victory. 
no stirrups or knights, and very little artillery. You had axes, spears, swords, but no warhammers, maces, or pikes. Only Kirken ever had crossbows. The rest had bows, javelins, or both at their disposal. Cloth and leather had been weaved for levies, while the royal retinues and elites got scale or male armor. So, you can see here that Thrones of Britannia faced a rather severe issue in its warscape. How to make the battles exciting? How can they possibly compete against the previous titles? How to avoid repetition, staleness, or outright boredom with the military structure of the major factions at your perusal? I must admit, the prospect of almost infantry-only armies bothered me. I like my dismounted noble knights from Total War Medieval 2, or the awesome dwarf and hammerers from Total War Warhammer 2, but I also use ranged tactics quite often, with artillery my main focus. Who can ever resist the power of cannons anyway? Also, a thunderous, powerful charge of your heavy cavalry into the enemy flanks or rear is just glorious to behold. Not to mention that, yes, the period and the scope of Thrones of Britannia already answered the second question. No, it can't compete with Creative Assembly's past. The odds were hopeless from the beginning. Critics use that point the most, often buttressed by the infamous Spearman Eye meme that satirizes the era's simpler nature in its military. The harshest deem it as a waste of time due to the sheer pressure it faces both from fans and the developers' past works. The more benevolent reviewers have pondered the point of this project. Why spend so much resources, effort, team members and time for a product whose warscape at first glance is, as they'd say, cookie cutter and boring? After all, shouldn't every total war be about new implementations, successful experimentations and improvements? Well, yes. That's what Thrones of Britannia is about. And, for some bizarre reason, not too many people have gotten the point of it. Allow me to explain. When I played through the game, first time as Gwynedd, I quickly understood the Warscape's direction. Without a large-scale variety, the developers had to maximize the available military much more. Armor-piercing damage, splash damage from explosives or magic, and the accumulated power behind a cavalry charge used to be a primary concern in several such games. So many Total War players remember the times when a single gallop or volley ended an entire battle swiftly or how one vortex destroyed an opponent's elite core, and the rest became chaff for your units. In Thrones of Britannia, literally, every weapon and its unit counts. They hold crucial roles on the battlefield. In each major faction, there's only one, maybe two units you'll never use after early game. To achieve effective, decisive victories, imagine your unit pool as a toolbox for broken machinery. It has everything you need to fix it. The fewer items you apply, though, the harder it's going to be for you to repair it. Thrones of Britannia made me actually care about these segmented roles. I couldn't just look at the damage output and armor statistics. I had to consider their advantages from start to finish. Spears fend off the cavalry the best, but they're also the strongest defense line against any infantry and can become a target for enemies. Swords have the highest melee skill which triumphs over every axe and spear. Most of the sword units have good armor as well, so they'll thrive in the thickest, bloodiest melees. Your spears, then, can watch out for cavalry or tie in the less important enemy units. Meanwhile, the swords engage in the mightiest and, due to that melee skill, beat them. They massacre low to mid-tier infantry. Axes, on the other hand, are excellent against armor and have a powerful charge. However, they're not that good at holding their ground at all. So, you wait for your spears and swords to create a line, and then flank or rear-attack the opponent with them. Two-handed axes, like the Irish Gallo Glasses, or the one-handed Viking Berserkers are even better. You can slaughter hundreds, both levies and retinue elites, in less than a minute if your plan goes well. Javelins pierce through both shields and armor, so every unit is in severe danger from their volleys, a flank or a rear hurl can spell a disaster even for the fearsome berserkers. But any unit, even low-tier spears, can beat them in close combat, and archers, with a longer range, can devastate them before they are unleashed. You have to wait for the exact proper time to use your javelins. 
Archers have retained their classic role since the earlier games, but they're much more powerful and effective than in the other historical titles. In fact, the Welsh Longbowmen, my favourite unit ever, is... it's just stunning. Six of them, against one unit of any kind, can eliminate it with one, maybe two volleys. For an infantry-focused game, purpose is heightened to the utmost degree. Without axes, you won't do well in flank or rear attack tactics. Without swords, your infantry won't have that crucial duelist to fend off the elites. Without spears, cavalry will crisscross you from all directions. Thrones of Britannia, then. Experiments in the application of everything you have. This includes formations. While there are none turned into abilities, as in, for example, Total War Medieval 2, this game still encourages you to prepare for battle based on your strength, the enemy's strength, and the terrain. Throughout the conflicts you'll experience, to undergo only one line change is very rare. You'll marshal one unit, several units, entire lines to win. Because of the infantry boxed formations, maneuvering is inherently strategic and easy to do. The developers have eliminated the dreadful spaghetti lines, apparent in the release version of Total War Rome 2. Combat is quite speedy, similar to the Warhammer trilogy. Battles last from 8 to 10 minutes, siege maps 15 at most. Again, Total War fans are more used to longer, drawn-out combat scenarios from the past, but I didn't mind the shortened battles that much. True, to observe an epic clash for a long moment can be awesome, but this speed makes you concentrate more and pay greater attention to the engagement's development as well. On higher difficulties, you don't have much legroom to sit back and watch your strategy unfold. The game's Attila engine doesn't beautify the warscape as much as the gorgeous vistas of Total War Warhammer 2, but they're still serviceable. Soldiers have detailed equipment and varied animations, both in combat and idle modes. Nordic symbols can be observed on the round, large shields, and individual mail links gleamed in the sun. Landscape 2 has no errors to complain about. Foliage can be removed in forested areas, so that you can observe the battle's development better, and I've encountered no environmental glitches or outright bugs in my playthroughs. Night engagements can be particularly intense. A fight in a blackened, dense forest is a hellish situation to control. The wintry locations impress me the most. A bird's view of a snowed village huddled away from a flat plain you'll fight on feels quite authentic. I remember these a lot from my Kirken campaign, when I waged war against the Gaelic clans in the north. Sieges were an excellent surprise. Based on famous provincial capitals, whether it's Dyflin, London, or Castletone, there's a different city layout. These are also further distinguished by cultural landmarks or architecture. You still have capture points and towers to worry about, but their positions are determined by what settlement you besiege. War walks can twist around a cliff, create a neat straight line, or create a half circle for your ranged infantry. Some outskirts can hide almost your entire army up to the war walks themselves, if you're fortunate enough. These create a wide array of tactical possibilities that concern your army arrangement, what siege engines you have at your disposal, and what capture points to focus on. If Chieftain's Hall, which is basically the game's town square, can be right above you but protected by solid walls and a thick line of defenders. Other times, it can be the farthest objective, so you might rather want to destroy the garrison first. The overall aesthetic and atmosphere of Sieges complements this. You can see the developers put great care in their presentation. Provincial capitals feel prestigious. Harbors can be attacked from all sides. A half-hidden hamlet looks pathetic against two armies clashing next to it. This, however, has also drawn ire from Total War fans, and this time with good reason. It fascinates me that Creative Assembly can design such good siege maps, and yet, their current biggest success, the Warhammer Trilogy, has absolute lackluster sieges. Not too many fans like them at all. Sure, one counter-argument is the different scope of Thrones of Britannia, and modern game design has gotten a lot more expensive these days. And yet, Total War Medieval 2 had a weaker engine with fewer opportunities than Attila, and it provided you epic sieges as well. Total War Shogun 2, a game not too distant in Creative Assembly's history, also had unique siege maps. Do I need to remind everyone of Kyoto itself? So, the company might have an excuse for a weak Warhammer siege maps, but it's a poor one at that, and an even poorer if Three Kingdoms show share the quality, or surpass it, of this game. The Warscape sound design is as always of high quality. 
Creative Assembly knows which soundtracks to use in battle. Thrones of Britannia has a much shorter track list than in the other games, but almost every battle theme sounds epic, especially the Last Stand or To Valhalla. A melee clamor hasn't been abandoned either. When you position your camera in the center of a skirmish, the weapons clang, men shriek and taunt each other. It can feel deafening when thousands face off thousands. So, what other experimentations occurred? Twice in recruitment. First, you can recruit any unit anywhere. It depends on your research technology and the passage of time. Second, you didn't recruit a full regiment at once. It starts at long numbers and it needs several turns, or conquests, to fill up its meter. This is such a good idea, to be frank. You can't avoid tough battles by spamming one unit in a single turn, and you have to think where you recruit and from what pool you conscript. You must also consider this. Do you attack a nearby force now with your fresh recruits, or wait a while for their strength to grow, and deliver a terrible blow upon the enemy? It also tightens the bond of historical accuracy and game design as well. Levies were basically peasants, forced to fight any war their liege desired, and retinues in Eastern Europe, for example, stayed in their own villages or keeps where they waited for the next command. You couldn't have mustered an entire village as well, it still needed to provide food, metals, or other income to the kingdom. As such, your campaign evolves differently this time. If you destroy an opponent's elite army, and no one survived, it'll take them a long while to build another one, and by that point, you've captured much of their territory. In the past, and these days, it takes several armies and a long, bloody slog before a faction is beaten. Now, wars are quicker, but more brutal, and the weight of your tactical decisions can predetermine entire decades of campaign time ahead. Garrisons have also changed. Now, they reside in provincial capitals and guard just them. Villagers, no matter what their resource is, are defenseless against invaders. Criticism is spotted here as well, due to increased difficulty and unpredictability of war. And yet, it's exactly the point. A kingdom in early medieval British Isles would never have so much food, coin, and equipment to have a garrison in every village. Wars have also been conducted this way. A captured village could provoke the faction leader to storm out or starve out the enemy populace to submission. In fact, this design choice provides the best situations in your campaigns, surgical fatal strikes. Say you need to beat Gwynedd as Diflin, and your base of operations is mana. The Welsh have to be invaded by naval means, and they're a bit far away. They also have plenty of farms that feed several small or too big elite forces. They're now at war with Mirchi to the east, and they might not expect you to attack. So, you do. An unsuspected declaration of war. You can go ahead and take their capital, but you still have to beat their contingents. Or, you can assemble your elite retinue, and a small skirmish of force, and claim as many farms as you can. What happens then? Gwynedd starves. Armies can't be supplied. To the point where Gwynedd relinquishes some of their units to avoid public disorder or usurper overthrows. And now, these fearsome, well-trained Welshmen are a half, maybe even a third, of what you had to face. I had so much fun doing this. You can now analyze the economic and agricultural potential of your enemy and capture what weakens them the most. It's not about a slaughter after slaughter anymore. There are actual nerve centers now, and if you excise them, the advantages of that are insane. Thrones of Britannia's developers have found a clever, fun way of turning a conflict into an organic scenery made unpredictable in its evolution based on what you target. You can destroy every faction in several different ways, each valid. For me, this is the first Total War game where I defeated an enemy not by an endless massacre of chaff until I reached their capital, but a calculated, merciless elimination of everything that was needed for a proper management. That moment, when you subdue a stronger, fiercer foe through starvation and poverty, is incredible. The AI's performance varies on the difficulty you choose. I almost never play Total War games on the lighter challenges, easy and normal, because I've always found these games on them way too easy. So, what I'm going to describe is an experience based on the very hard selection. Enemy AI has a mix of good and bad, as in every Total War game. If they can, they will overwhelm you numerically, either by a 20 stack against your smaller stack, 
although positions several armies around you for a massive onslaught. Power level has also received a sharper representation. A faction stronger than yours will intimidate you, both in Geo and War scale. On the other hand, a once mighty kingdom reduced to a fiefdom is a notable change in the area you operate in. Your opponents also won't conquer random villages or provincial capitals this time, a problem I've often encountered in Total War Warhammer 2. If they lack food, they'll go for your agricultural estates. If they'll spot a weakened capital nearby, they'll go for it in an instant. Same for your own forces. It's better to withdraw a wounded contingent to avoid its loss by an overpowered attack. At the same time, enemies can be quite sneaky. Lochlan, in my media campaign, continuously avoided my invading forces and tried to recapture the island regions I've taken from them. As Gwynedd, I recall how West Siaxa positioned almost all of their armies at our mutual borders, in case another war's in the horizon and I'll execute aggressive expansionism again. For the negatives, it's rare for your enemy to defend their provincial capitals with more than the garrison itself. Most of the secondary factions will upgrade them for sure, but they won't spend their main force on its reinforcement. Opponents also struggle with catastrophic defeats. If you crush their elite force or take their factional capital, that's pretty much it for them. Unless they've accumulated a lot of wealth from their past campaigns. I've yet to see any defeated faction, major or secondary, experiencing an unexpected revival. You might have also noticed how I don't talk about naval combat. That's because I dislike it. It's a very simplistic take on Norse longship employed by every faction, followed by a long-range bombardment of infantry missiles and then ship-on-ship -ship combat. However, I do understand this from the historical perspective. If you exclude the Vikings, no Anglo-Saxon, Gaelic or Welsh land had as massive, advanced and effective navy as the Scandinavian raiders. West Siaxa itself, which unified England, had only 10 ships against literal hundreds from Norway and Denmark. To be quite honest, I didn't even go through one naval battle. There were only two Total War games where I cared about them, Medieval 2 and Shogun 2. I'll admit, Thrones of Britannia's Geoscape captivated and impressed me more than the Warscape due to the details. However, that isn't to say it didn't achieve its primary goals either. I've learned more about infantry management and formation in this game than in any other Total War. The game, successfully, made me think about additional unit details that I ignored in past Creative Assembly games, and the experimentations, particularly in the recruitment mechanics, are such good ideas, I hope they'll be seen in the next Total Wars. For this video, I've established three pillars. The first being a combination of an in-depth analysis and counter-critique to all the arguments pelted against Thrones of Britannia. But the other two, though, have a speculative and long-term ideas about not just this game's future, but also for the Saga series. And I've left them for the end because, in my opinion, the analysis has to come forth first. See, there's one major counter-argument that deflects every other opposition towards Thrones of Britannia. Its core philosophy. To elaborate, the outstanding tightness between its game design and historical accuracy. Most of the complaints, lack of agents, army stances, quote-unquote cookie-cutter military, lack of diversity both in Geoscape and Warscape, are predicated on Creative Assembly's product history. Every Total War has been grand, most importantly in scale. There were different rosters, races, eras, landscapes, but still, the grandness remained. And Total War fans got used to that, to the point where, if a Total War project is announced, they'll, in an instant, draw from the past and put those colored expectations on the soon-to-be-revealed title. On the surface, that is not such a bad practice. After all, a veteran games company and its history will conjure up somewhat accurate predictions for new releases. But to set it in stone, have it as an ironclad expectation is, to be honest, unreasonable. Creative Assembly has never stated that they won't do a game on a smaller scale. They didn't have the time, money, or motivation before Thrones of Britannia. Just remember, this company has also developed the impressive Alien Isolation, and recently, they've put up job postings for a new FPS IP. So, product diversification is very much on the horizon. Thrones of Britannia never meant to outmatch previous titles. 
It's an opportunity to create the most historically tight and accurate total wall. The most vibrant and detailed representation of an era that hasn't been covered yet. Here then, is a significant title despite its smaller price tag and sales. A core philosophy, near impossible before, due to fiscal and time constraints, now displayed in its most beautiful, thoughtful form. I am, to this day, stunned at the complexity and interwoven details of Thrones of Britannia. Never have I felt so immersed, educated and involved in a historic period. Never has a Total War game captivated me so with its geoscape. That achievement, the symbiosis of game design and history, must be highlighted because it's incredible. But my final point is even more important to me than this one. As I played through the post-Allegiance version, something clicked in my head. The continuous blog posts about the game, its development cycle, its main purpose, it all fitted to an idea I already kind of had about the Saga series. And when I discussed this with my good friend and game designer Revenger, he gave the thought a title that I think is perfect. The Total Workshop. The Saga series isn't a fun, little diversion from Creative Assembly's primary foci. It's a blueprint for the future. Imagine a master armorer who owns a massive factory that belches out the best equipment for any soldier in a professional army. It has its established macro and micro, what commissions are accepted, when they're done, what the masters will do, and what the apprentices will work on. These are also supported by designs and demands set in the years of the factory's operation. But every once in a while, there comes an innovation or an experimentation that needs to be explored. And yet, the factory isn't suited for whimsical creations. So, the master armorer has their own small workshop attached next to the factory or built in their own home. And in there, they have the time, resources and energy to forge something new and unseen. The Saga series is that metaphor. In it, I suspect Creative Assembly will develop ideas that need a different approach. Some won't succeed, others will. And based on that ratio, they'll, in whatever measure, implement them in future games. Thrones of Britannia had a unique recruitment system, and because it works so well, expected to appear in a non-Saga Total Wars. Total War Warhammer 2's rights have been transformed into legislative edicts in Thrones of Britannia. A historical Total War with the first ever fantasy mechanic in it. And it works beautifully. War Fervor didn't fare well, and it was removed in the Allegiance update. But maybe, just maybe, in the next projects, they'll forget about it already or shape it up better. Who knows? The Total Workshops could be an awesome and interactive way of improving the Total War franchise. It seems, in the current years, that Creative Assembly wants to be more transparent and involved in its fanbase. We see that in blog posts, explanations for controversial mistakes, and the upped quality in their additional content features. And the Saga series could be another extension of that. They want to see what works for fans, what doesn't, and from that construct a foundation. Hence the smaller price tag the lack of geographic grandeur, and, in tow, the possible lack of DLCs or FLCs. As a company, they don't have the time, resources or manpower to stop game development for several years and design all the experiments into one huge game. They can't predict the fanbase's satisfaction and reception of everything they'll do. And, if it would turn out to be a great failure, it could cripple the company for the next years to come. On the other, rather unfortunate hand, the Saga series seems to be the only way for the designers to improve and analyze themselves. Let's face it, they're a monopoly, a large one. Nobody makes games like theirs, nobody has tried it yet, and Creative Assembly is already plagued by monopolist behavior, whether it is the slow, ponderous innovation or troublesome communication about a controversy. Some of their severe mistakes in business practice woke them up partially, but not wholly. And as long as there won't be another Creative Assembly, or a Total War-like, don't expect a progressive change very soon. I'd even say that the toxic, hostile attitudes of their fans 
reflect the artistic imbalance in their corner of the game's industry. And also the lack of stern, disciplined mods on their Facebook or Reddit forums, to be quite fair. So, if Total War fans who fume at the supposed laziness of the developers or their soulless disrespect of their demands want this series to improve, be smoother, better, then it is in their best interest to see the Saga series turn into a success. It provides us direct, interactive means of feedback. It'll contain ideas that we might see again in bigger Total Wars. These developers want to see how we handle the provided mechanics in the game, how we critique and viewed them. Not our venom-infested novels on Reddit about how they're all scamming us out of our money or using the weakest, most irrelevant arguments from which no designer would ever, ever learn. Which is why I'm worried the Saga series might become a failure. Because if it does, and it's cancelled, show me another means that won't turn the fanbase even more hostile and the company more financially constrained due to lack of revenue. Never mind its monopolistic status. The reality we face doesn't give us any more options on how we tackle the much-needed revitalization of the historic Total Wars. We're stuck with what we've got. One might suggest modding tools and the wonderful content modders produce as a counter-argument, but as admirable as they are, they're not core instrumental mechanics of the enhanced games. They're aesthetical mods or light additions that change what statistical data can be changed, but nothing else. The Warhammer Trilogy tools have a much greater influence on the developers. This can't be said of the historical games. Also, let's be fair, mod conversions happen much more, the perfect example being Total War Medieval 2, than what the products need for innovation. We need to play and properly examine the Saga series. We can't just reject them for what they offer. We need more, deeper interaction between us and the developer so that they hear our takes and consider their implementation. To have better products from Creative Assembly, an organic, substantive cooperation should be above endless, bitter antagonization. And if the Total War fanbase is beyond that, if its majority is far too addicted to the hate they spread on social media and the paranoid skepticism that creeps into their arguments, then we won't have a better Total War. We'll have a monopolistic, jaded developer who will keep doing the same game with little innovation because the moment they'll grow bold, they're slapped in the face. They'll become too cautious, worried, and afraid to exceed themselves. There has been a basis for this outrage. Total War Rome 2's launch state was unacceptable, just as much as the Warriors of Chaos Day 1 DLC. We've generated enough of an outcry so that they'll think again the next time an identical idea pops up in their heads. But they clearly improved. In recent times, they've published superb additional content and updates. Total War Warhammer 2 is one of the best works they've ever put out. So let's forgive, but not forget. Yet. Let Creative Assembly grow, explore, redeem themselves. Purify the Venom, so that we may see better games from them. This is why Thrones of Britannia is so important, as is the Saga series. It holds an incredible potential that can't be squandered or turned to ash before it expands. And because I love the Total War franchise, I'll continue to defend the Saga series until either I'm proven wrong, or it'll generate the benefits I've predicted in this video. Thank you for listening.